Welcome to the online video content to accompany the Organic Chemistry 2 Lecture Guide 2018 by Rhett Smith. The numbers at the top of each slide in this video content refer to lesson numbers from Organic Chemistry 1 Primer 2017 by Tennyson et al. These slides come from Appendix 1, which covers select topics from Organic Chemistry 1 as a review for an Organic Chemistry 2 course. One of the primary skills we learned in Organic Chemistry 1 was the ability to use curved arrows to represent the flow of electrons as a means of understanding bond forming and breaking that takes place as part of reaction mechanisms. Several elementary steps can be used as building blocks to assemble more complicated sequences of electron movements that comprise reactions large in organic chemistry one. We will cover several of these elementary steps here. Coordination, the forward reaction shown for step one on this slide, on page 231 of the lecture guide, is simply the formation of a sigma bond and only one arrow is involved in this process, the donation from a Lewis base to a Lewis acid, for example. The reverse of this process, heterolysis, is simply breaking that sigma bond and separating the two species from one another. Many reactions in organic 1, such as the SN1, E1, reactions and some of the reactions of alkenes such as hydrohalogenation and hydration involve a carbocation rearrangement as a possible step and this occurs when you move some species an alkyl group or a hydride from one carbon to an adjacent carbon electrophilic addition is when an electrophile adds to a pi bond there must be a pi bond present electrophilic elimination on the other hand going the other way from the right to the left involves eliminating an electrophilic species and forming a pi bond. The E2 reaction is a concerted reaction that actually involves three separate arrows to show three pairs of electrons moving around at the same time. A strong base is necessary to remove the proton. The leaving group will leave, often as an anion. And when the proton is removed by the base in this step, you form a pi bond right there. The SN2 reaction is a concerted flow of two pairs of electrons. A nucleophile attacks a carbon to which a leaving group is attached, the leaving group generally departing as some type of rather stable species. Nucleophilic addition often involves a negatively charged nucleophile pushing electrons towards a carbon, often one that is partially positively charged in a polar double bond. Nucleophilic elimination, we'll see many examples of this in this course, happens when the negative charge on some atom is pushed down into this space with elimination of some leaving group, here it's abbreviated NU, to reform the pi bond in the opposite direction. Now since these arrow pushing steps are so important towards understanding many reaction processes in organic chemistry, we should take a closer look at some of these types of elementary steps. Starting with coordination, and one of the early reactions we learned is the neutralization when a strong base and a strong acid come in contact with one another to form water. And that's an example of a coordination reaction, a Lewis acid, Lewis base reaction where one sigma bond is formed in that process. The opposite of that process would be heterolysis where the water would break into the strong base and the strong acid. Now you don't need these species to be charged for coordination to happen. When we have BH3 and the boron has less than an octet of electrons, you can have another neutral species that has a lone pair as the donor in the coordination to form this zwitter ion. Heterolysis would occur if that process was reversed. Coordination can also involve a charged species and a neutral species. So there's nothing constraining us with respect to the type of species that can be involved in these types of processes. In this case, the oxygen of a carbonyl donates electrons to a proton, and that leads to the formation of this new sigma bond. Heterolysis would occur if the proton were to come off, pushing those two electrons back onto the oxygen, which would then be a lone pair again. Carbocation rearrangement happens as part of mechanistic uh, pathway in several reactions that we've seen in organic one, and this tends to occur when you attain a more stable species by doing so. For example, a primary carbocation could undergo rearrangement where this hydride with the two electrons has moved to the carbon on the right, leaving you with a positive charge and a carbon that is now tertiary. There are two types of carbocation rearrangements we've seen, really. If a hydrogen with its two electrons, a hydride, is what moves over, we call it a hydride shift, a 1-2 hydride shift. If an alkyl group, such as the methyl group in this example, 
is the thing that moves over, we can call it a 1,2-methyl shift, or more generally a 1,2-alkyl shift if it's a different type of alkyl group. If we consider electrophilic addition, such as the first step of a hydrohalogenation or a hydration of an alkene, we have to have some type of electrophile. We also have to have a pi bond so that the electrophile can add to that pi bond. When that occurs, you are left with a cationic site on one of the sides. Electrophilic elimination occurs when your electrophile is eliminated, leaving these two electrons behind, as indicated by this arrow, to push them into the space, and those two electrons would then be the pi bond on the left. One of the reactions that we will see later in organic chemistry too will be what is known as electrophilic aromatic substitution. We'll see that this reaction is simply a combination of two of the reactions we've already covered. Electrophilic addition of some electrophile, in this case an iodinium cation, leads to this cationic species with breaking of a pi bond, followed by electrophilic elimination. But what we eliminate is a different species than what we added in the first step. So the net result after reformation of this pi bond is that you've replaced an H with an I. We spend a good deal of time in Organic Chemistry 1 courses studying the substitution and elimination pathways and comparing SN1, SN2, E1, and E2 reactions. Here's an example of an E2 reaction. It's concerted, so all three of these pairs of electrons are moving at the same time, and there's no chance for anything to rearrange. And here we've numbered these two carbons, carbons 1 and 2, to show how you would have a pi bond form between carbons 1 and 2 in the structure. At times, it can be important which proton is removed by the base. The proton that's removed and the leaving group that comes off in this concerted process must be pointed opposite directions from one another. This is what is known as an anti-paraplanar arrangement of the H and the Br. When this occurs, you will get the product shown here. Now the E2 reaction can take place, in this case, to form a di-substitute alkene. Remember that you're always trying to make the more stable alkene, that's the Zaitsev rule, so you would make the indicated trans alkene and not the cis or monosubstitute alkenes that are also possible products of an E2 reaction of this particular substrate. The SN2 reaction requires a good nucleophile. It also requires a good leaving group. And if the nucleophile attacks the same carbon that has a leaving group on it, we have a concerted formation of this new sigma bond with concomitant breakage of this sigma bond. So you make one sigma bond while another one breaks. That's how it is different from a coordination or heterolysis reaction. A specific example might be this nucleophile, shown in green, this isopropoxide, attacking this bromomethane carbon. If you did this, you would get this isopropyl nucleophile substituting for the bond that same carbon used to be making to the bromine. We can also use this cyanide nucleophile to attack this secondary carbon of this iodopentane, and we would get a cyanopentane with an iodide leaving group. A couple of things about the SN2 reaction that you learned later in the course were that if this was a chiral center, you would have stereoinversion. This is what is known as the Walden inversion. In organic chemistry 2, we will do many, many reactions that involve nucleophilic additions and nucleophilic elimination, so it is important for you to review these particular types of reaction carefully. A nucleophilic addition is different from an SN2 reaction. We just saw the SN2 reaction where the nucleophile attacks and makes a single bond, and it breaks the single bond that was going to the leaving group. Now in the nucleophilic addition, you're still attacking a carbon, you're still using a nucleophile to do so, but the thing that you're breaking, the bond you're breaking, is a pi bond. The, one of the bonds in the double bond is a sigma bond, and it's still there, even after the nucleophile has attacked, and that's how it's different. So you can have a nucleophilic addition like the one shown at the top. In the nucleophilic elimination, you're eliminating a nucleophile to make a pi bond. So a lone pair from this OH group might push into this space to make this bond. This second arrow here is indicative of breaking this bond and pushing that pair onto this oxygen. So you would get a new pi bond right here. That's the new bond you've made. And this is the nucleophilic species that you've eliminated. A nucleophilic addition can occur between this acid chloride and a hydroxide. The hydroxide will push electrons towards this carbon. The electrons in this pi bond will be pushed up onto the oxygen, leaving it with a formal charge of minus one. And if we did electrophilic elimination, we would eliminate probably the most stable anion, which is chloride. Just push the electrons down into this space to make a new pi bond, and push these electrons in this pi bond onto the chlorine. 
So in the end you have carbon with four bonds again, but you've eliminated a different nucleophilic elimination product. So in this example, once we got to the species, we kind of made a prediction about which of these species would be eliminated. You could have eliminated this, or this, or this unit when you remade the pi bond. We chose to eliminate chloride because it is the most stable of the possible leaving groups in this case. And this brings us to another very important point from Organic Chemistry 1, where we have to look at structures and make predictions regarding the stability of different species, and that helps us predict reaction products and whether reactions will be thermodynamically favorable or spontaneous. The first context in which we saw this concept was in making predictions about acid strength. If we consider a protic acid when we have a formation of an H+, which combines with the water to form this hydronium ion, you have to have the conjugate base of that acid form. The more stable this conjugate base is, the stronger the acid that produced it. So a very strong acid produces a very stable conjugate base, and a weaker acid would have to produce a less stable, more difficult to form base. Fortunately, we can look at the structures of various potential conjugate bases and make predictions about their stability, rather than just memorizing a bunch of acid strengths. The first effect I want to talk about here in the context of organic chemistry and the types of acids we usually see there is the electronegativity. Electronegativity plays a strong role in the stability of the conjugate base because by the very definition, the more electronegative A, the atom with the negative charge on it, the more electronegative it is, the stronger its attraction for negative charge. That's what electronegativity means. And so, the conjugate base is more stable because of that attractive stabilizing force. So if we were to rank these familiar organic species in terms of acidity, we have to think about what the conjugate bases would be. Now fluorine is the most electronegative, followed by oxygen, followed by nitrogen, carbon is the least electronegative. So this reflects the stability of the anions, most stable being fluoride, as well as the strength of the acid that produced that conjugate base. Hydrofluoric acid would be much stronger acid than water, which in turn is stronger than ammonia, which in turn is a stronger acid than methane. One influence on the electronegativity of an atom that may not have been covered in your general chemistry class is that different hybridizations on the same atom will also change the electronegativity of that atom. And the more S character that an atom has, the more electronegative it will be. From an organic chemistry standpoint, the sp versus sp2 versus sp3 hybridized carbons are a great illustration of this. If we take a look at the acidity of a species that only has sp3 hybridized carbons, the pKa is 51. And remember that a lower pKa is a stronger acid. So much, much, much stronger acid is reflected in this compound, ethylene, with only sp2 hybridized carbons. But if you remove a proton from an sp hybridized carbon, like in a terminal alkyne, you will get an acetylide type anion like this, where now you've got the negative charge on an sp hybridized carbon. Since that's the most electronegative of the carbons, it's also the most acidic of the species. Many, many times more acidic than the corresponding alkene. We've also seen in Organic Chemistry 1 that resonance is also a stabilizing influence on a species. So if we take a look at these particular acids, hydrofluoric, acetic acid, and methanol, and we take a look at how acidic they are, well, the strongest acid is going to be hydrofluoric acid because the conjugate base, fluoride, would be a conjugate base in which the negative charge on the more electronegative atom on a fluorine. So that makes sense on the basis of our previous discussion on electronegativity. And now these other two cases, acetic acid and methanol, would both lead to conjugate bases that have a minus charge on oxygen. Either a methoxide would be formed or this acetate would be formed. Now because the acetic acid has resonance contributors to the structure, its anion is much more stable. So this is a much stronger acid. Within a group, the size of the atom with the negative charge on it also has a strong effect on the acidity because a larger atom has a larger volume over which to spread the excess negative charge, and this leads to a greater stability with a greater size. If we think about the conjugate bases that form from these hydrohalic acids, in the case of hydrofluoric acid, we'd have F minus. We'd have a chloride, 
bromide or iodide for the other members of the series. These atoms get progressively larger as you go down the column, and the acids get progressively stronger as well. Inductive effects come into play when we can't figure out which of the conjugate bases should be more stable on the basis of any of the other effects we've talked about. So you only consider this if you have a tie between two species in your initial analysis, let's say. And what you're looking for when you're evaluating inductive effects are possible attractive or repulsive forces within the structure. We're first going to talk about stabilizing attractive forces between the anionic atom, since we are talking about stabilizing anions, and a positive charge. If we think about these acetic acid derivatives, once the proton comes off, we're really trying to figure out which of these potential conjugate bases would be more stable. If we look at acetic acid with no halogen substituents, and we compare that to the one with the fluorine, we can readily identify that there's a polar bond between fluorine and carbon. And the attraction between that partial positive charge on that carbon and that negative charge on the oxygen is very stabilizing compared to the conjugate base of acetic acid, this acetate, which doesn't have that stabilizing force induced by that nearby fluorine. So this is the strongest acid. Now you can also draw in partial charges for the chloride, bromide, or iodide attached to a carbon as well. But fluorine is more electronegative, so that bond is more polar. More polar means there's more positive charge here which means that there is a greater attraction, a greater stabilizing force. So this series in the top row serves to illustrate that a more polar bond leads to greater partial positive charge and is more stabilizing. What about a case where we have the same atom in each of the cases, like here? We have bromine, bromine, bromine. But that bromine is positioned at the carbon right here, pretty near where that oxygen with the minus charge will be in the conjugate base versus here where you're moving the bromine a little farther away and finally way out here in the third case. Well of course if you've got a partial positive charge induced on a carbon here versus way down here versus even farther away way down on this carbon that attractive force is going to be diminished as you get further away. So this second series here just illustrates that a polar bond closer to the deprotonated site will be more stabilizing than if you move that same bond farther away. So that covers the general most common cases of stabilizing inductive effects that we will see in organic chemistry. What about destabilizing effects? I mentioned that inductive effects could be stabilizing or destabilizing. Well, you're looking for repulsive interactions between the conjugate base anion and some other part of the molecule when you're looking at identifying destabilizing inductive effects. So let's think about the conjugate bases from deprotonation of an alcohol. Obviously you'd want to take the proton off of the oxygen, not from one of the carbons, because, well, oxygen is more electronegative. So that's going to be the more stable anion than putting a negative charge on a carbon. And then we say, well, the minus charge and the oxygen in all these cases, so they all have the same electronegativity, they're all the same size, none of these have resonance, so the only effect we can use to differentiate the stability of these four species would be the inductive effects. Are there inductive effects that are stabilizing or destabilizing? Well, to understand this, we have to look at these adjacent branches. We have two methyl groups here and only one here. The other things are just hydrogens. The more of these branches you have, the more repulsive the interaction is going to be. Because remember that bonds are made out of electrons. A negatively charged oxygen has three lone pairs on it. Now, lone pairs of electrons are negative, bonds are made of electrons that are also negative, so adjacent bonds sticking up into that space where the lone pairs are will repel them. And you learned that bonding pairs of electrons and lone pairs of electrons had some repulsion when you learned about the VSEPR model in general chemistry. So the more of these branches you have at the site adjacent to where the negative charge is, you're replacing these little hydrogens with these branched structures, these alkyl groups generally in organic chemistry, the more repulsive forces you'll have and the less stable it will be. So the lone pair will repel nearby bonding pairs, so more and bigger branches that are adjacent to the deprotonated and now negatively charged atom will lead to lower anion stability and thus a weaker conjugate acid. In addition to anionic species, we encountered many cases of reactions where a carbocation intermediate was involved, and we then had to figure out would that carbocation rearrange. But 
First, we have to figure out the relative stabilities of cations in the first place. One thing that we probably learned in all the different sections of organic chemistry, one, would be that the more branches you have adjacent to the positively charged carbon, the more stable it is. So a methyl cation is the least stable, primary is a little better, secondary is a little more stable, and tertiary is the most stable. And the explanation for that is really quite related to what we just saw for bonding pairs repelling anionic sites on the previous page. So if we have a cationic site, it's positively charged carbon, it's going to attract negative charge towards it. So bonding pairs being made of negative electrons would be attracted to that plus charge. And this is such an important influence in organic chemistry and the stability of cations that it has a special name. This attractive interaction is referred to as hyperconjugation. As for anions, cations can also be stabilized by resonance because of the delocalization of the charge. So if I have a primary cation with resonance, this actually has this about the same stability as a secondary cation. Having an additional resonance contributor then is similar to adding an additional alkyl substituent. Radicals follow the same trend as cations. We didn't see them in as many types of reactions as we saw for cations, but the trends are very similar. More non-hydrogen branches leads to a more stable radical. And the reason for that is similar again to what we saw with carbocations. We have a carbon that only has seven valence electrons, so that carbon is in need of additional electrons to reach its octet. So if there are electrons nearby, it has a natural pull for those. An attractive force, or a pull for these electrons, leads to them being more stable. Resonance, though, plays a stronger role in stabilizing radicals than it did with cations. So if we have a primary radical that also has resonance, this is actually a little bit more stable than a secondary radical. So resonance is more stabilizing than one more alkyl substituent. But a tertiary radical is still more stable than a primary with resonance to another primary site. So the trends are the same, but that little wrinkle differentiates the relative stability of radicals versus cations. Now with an understanding of structural influences on the relative stabilities of anions, cations, and radicals, we ought to start being able to make predictions regarding the direction of equilibria and the relative favorability of reactions. It's very important to be able to identify thermodynamically favorable, also called spontaneous, reactions. These reactions are ones in which the products are more stable than the starting materials. And whether a reaction is spontaneous or not can often be determined by assessing anion or cation stability of the products and reactants. Here's an example problem that I've used on past exams and worksheets in class. And it says, assuming that each process is mechanistically accessible, meaning it's possible, use your knowledge of stability trends to predict whether the formation of the product would be thermodynamically favorable. In the case of reaction A, we're taking one cation, which is secondary, doing a carbocation rearrangement on it, and it becomes tertiary. Well, we know that a tertiary carbocation is more stable than secondary, so that would be a thermodynamically favorable reaction. In reaction B, we see that we have an anion reacting with a neutral species to produce a different neutral species and another anion. In these cases, where you have neutral species, you realize that the anions are a lot more unstable than are the neutral species in a general context. So we're going to focus only on the anions and that's good for us. It simplifies the problem and we have a good understanding of structural features that determine the relative stability of the anions. In one case the negative charge on the oxygen of hydroxide. In the other case the negative charge is on the nitrogen. Well oxygen is more electronegative so the reactants, this hydroxide, is actually the more stable of the two anions there. So this reaction will not be spontaneous to the right, it would be spontaneous to the left to form reactants from these products. Finally we have this case where we have an anion over here plus a neutral species, which we'll kind of ignore. We lead to a product that's a neutral species and this product that is an anion. So we're really comparing the stability of this anion to the stability of this anion. The product one has a minus charge on nitrogen, which is both larger and more electronegative than hydrogen. So by both counts, our structural trend predictions would say that this is our more stable anion. And that would mean that the products are favored over the reactants. This also helps us determine the direction of equilibria in chemical reactions as well. If we recall our definition of equilibrium from general chemistry, a reaction at equilibrium is one in which the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction. 
Now that doesn't mean there's an equal amount of reactions and products. It just means that the rate at which they interconvert has reached an equilibrium or steady state. And the equation that we learned in general chemistry, you won't really use that in organic, but if the equilibrium constant is greater than one, you have more products than reactants. The numerator is greater than is the denominator. So you can make predictions as to whether any given reaction will be favored to the right or the left on the basis of analyzing the relative stabilities of the reactants and products. Consider this nucleophilic addition reaction. Now we'll, we're going to see this reaction later in the semester. You don't know this reaction yet from organic one, but if I asked you to predict whether this reaction would be favorable or not, you could make this prediction. You'd say, well, this anion is doing a nucleophilic addition to this neutral species, and the product is an anion. So I'm going to compare the stability of the reactant anion with the stability of the product anion. Now this reactant anion has a minus charge on carbon. The product anion has a minus charge on oxygen. Oxygen is more electronegative, and we'd predict that this is more stable. So as we'll see later in the class, this is a very, very favorable reaction. Now we did learn the SN2 reaction last semester. And one thing we learned is that you can't just do a simple SN2 reaction on an alcohol without somehow activating that OH group because it's a bad leaving group. Well, even if we'd never learned the SN2 reaction, I asked you to predict whether this reaction is likely to be favorable. I hope you would then analyze these two anions and say, well, chloride is much bigger than oxygen, and the size rule is more important than is the electronegativity rule, if you recall from organic one. The chloride then is a much more stable anion than is the minus charge on the oxygen in hydroxide. So this side is favored. So that would not be a spontaneous reaction in the forward direction. And that helps us explain why uh, alcohols are bad substrates for SN2 reactions if we don't activate that OH group somehow. The third example on this page is another reaction we haven't learned specifically yet, but you can make a prediction as to whether it's a viable pathway. In this case, we take an anion with a minus charge on the oxygen, do a nucleophilic elimination, and that leads to pushing the minus charge onto a chlorine. Now this is more stable because the chloride has the minus charge on a big chlorine, whereas the starting material has the minus charge on a smaller oxygen. This would be favored in the forward direction. One way to conveniently show the changes in energy on going from a starting material to a product is by using these things called reaction coordinate diagrams. We can infer several things from reaction coordinate diagrams. First of all, to look at what the setup is. You have energy versus the reaction coordinate. Generally, you'll show your starting materials at the left-hand side of your reaction coordinate. Your products will go on the right side. And higher in energy is less stable. The more stable species are towards the bottom. So we can see that both of the two reactions shown by these traces here lead to products that are more stable than the reactant or intermediate from which they were derived. So, in general, you look at the stability in terms of looking at where the species are located on the y-axis, the delta G gives free energy axis, higher is less stable. We can then see whether a reaction is spontaneous by seeing whether the products are more stable than the reactants. These are both examples of spontaneous reactions. And we can also make inferences about the reaction rates. The reaction rate, you might remember from general chemistry, there are equations that relate the energy of activation to the rate. A lower energy of activation leads to a faster reaction. So between these two reactions, this one with a lower energy of activation is the faster one. Another important topic that we discussed in Organic Chemistry 1 is stereochemistry. A great deal of our discussion of stereochemistry had to do with understanding and describing the chirality or handedness of molecules. In our everyday lives, we tend to encounter handedness primarily in the form of identifying our right hand and left hand. It makes sense to draw an analogy between the chirality or handedness of molecules with the handedness of human type figures. So one way that you can envision the shape of a tetrahedral carbon, which has two units coming off of the central carbon that are in the plane, one that's away, one that's towards us, is to think about this sort of unusually drawn stick figure. The hand away from us, if this is a person doing push-ups, would be the person's right hand. And we can envision or transcribe the different parts of this human, the head, the feet, the right hand, the left hand, onto this tetrahedron. 
if I took the exact same person and they turned around, or we walked around and looked at them from the other side, then their right hand would be facing towards us. This is still the person's right hand, and this is still the person's left hand. And if I reoriented the molecule in a similar fashion, reorienting the part of the molecule that was the feet, shown in red, just like the feet of the stick figure, move those to the left to match up where that is pointing, and if we have the left hand like that, the same as the left hand up here in the other figure, you can see now that thinking about the molecular shape in terms of comparing it to someone doing push-ups might be a good way to be able to mentally reorient a molecule. Now, stereochemistry can be challenging because you can look at it, the same exact molecule in a bunch of different ways. And I try to illustrate this on page 254 of the lecture guide. In fact, every molecule on this page is just a different representation of S2-butanol drawn in different ways from different orientations. At the top I show you a way to draw 2-butanol. If you can name it 1, 2, then 3 and 4 carbons are down here in this ethyl group. It, you know it's a 2-butanol. And I simply rotate these groups at the bottom around while I leave this OH group at the top. I can rotate this H so it moves forward a little bit. I can, that would require me to move the CH3 over to there. And that would push the ethyl group up to the front. If I rotate my perspective again, I can rotate the ethyl group over to that position, like in the far right. And you can kind of see that if I just hold that OH group constant across the whole series here of different ways of viewing it, and I just rotate the molecule around, and you can confirm this with a molecular model kit, it's just the same molecule. I could also tip my molecule over, so I tip the OH to the bottom, and that would bring the C2H5, the ethyl group, up to the top, and then it would look like this, right? So if I tip this over on its side, I could have two other ways to draw my molecule where I just rotate these bottom substituents around and keep the ethyl group at the top. So the other two ways I could draw this would be rotating the CH3 over one spot, so it's here now. And then if I rotate the CH3 again, it would come all the way around to the front, it would look like this. But again, it's just the same molecule, taking it, tipping it over, rotating it around, and the same thing here, I could then tip it again in a way that the CH3 is at the top, and I start out with the OH on my left, rotate it to the front, rotate it to the right, and then I could tip my molecule over again and have the H at the top, the OH on the left, rotate it so the OH is on the middle, and then on the right. Now there is a need to represent molecules on a flat surface and, and somehow represent this three-dimensional shape that they actually have. And one of the conventions that scientists have developed a very long time ago and that we still use is called the Fisher projection. And in a Fisher projection, the horizontal lines, even though it's drawn like this, where you're not actually using wedges and hash lines, the convention, what this Fisher projection means, is that the horizontal lines, whatever these guys are here, those are coming towards you. So it's just as if you had drawn it like this. So when you see this Fisher projection, you should think about this. Now the Fisher projection shown here is just another way to draw this molecule. Right, so if I use the analogy between this molecule and a person doing push-ups, and I try to transpose my understanding of a person with hands, I could have this be the head, which is right here. The hand coming towards me, if this is a person doing push-ups, is this person's right hand, and this is the person's left hand. And the person's feet would be down at the bottom. All right, so if you can have that mental image, what a Fisher projection is showing you is that exact same person standing up looking at you with their arms coming towards you like they're trying to grab you or hug you. So if you transpose what was the right hand of this person doing the push-ups, that's the right hand. That was the hydrogen. That was what we're interpreting as being the person's right hand. So H, the person's left hand here, is in the away from us position over here. That's the ethyl group in the wedge and hash representation. So that's an ethyl group. And then the head, of course, is the OH group. And the feet would be the CH3 group. And now you can see that that representation, thinking of it as a person doing push-ups and then standing up, looking at that same exact person from a different perspective, 
that's a way to transpose from a Fisher projection to a wedge and hash line or vice versa. The ability to use the Fisher projection to assign R and S labels is another important skill and again remembering that the vertical axis in a Fisher projection indicates those groups are going away from you we can then easily prioritize the substituents coming off that central carbon and the hydrogen, the fourth priority substituent, is pointed away from us already. And this makes our task of assigning R and S very easy. We just count from 1 to 2 to 3. That's a clockwise procession, so that should have an R configuration. And that's an R2 butanol. Another type of problem that you might face in the course of doing organic chemistry would be one in which you have to convert between the representations, the different conventions. So if I have a Fisher projection of this molecule, it's the same one I drew up here, and I'm asked to draw a wedge and hash line representation of it instead. Well, I would start by thinking in my head, well, this is really like a person, there's their face, there's their hands, and there's the person's feet. And then I would have to assign, well, if someone's facing me, this is their right hand and their left hand, and this is their head, and this is their feet. And then I could draw the same person doing push-ups. So I could imagine in my head someone doing push-ups where their head would be sticking straight up unless they're upside down doing push-ups, and the head is the hydrogen. So I fill that in on my tetrahedron representation. The person's right hand is there, and that was the methyl group. So I filled the methyl group in on that corresponding position on my actual molecule. The left hand was an OH, and the feet was the ethyl group. You might be asked to draw a Fisher projection and or a wedge and hash line representation for a particular name, in this case R3-methylheptane. A really convenient way to do this is to first draw it without worrying about the stereochemistry at first. All right, so I've drawn it out here, I've just used all regular lines, and then I assign one as this whole long chain here, highest priority, second priority is this ethyl, third priority is this methyl, and of course the lowest priority, fourth priority substituents, the hydrogen. Now, I can place my fourth priority away. I could have put it at the top or bottom of the Fisher projection, because those are both, by convention, pointing away from the viewer. Once I do that, I can just write the numbers 1, 2, and 3 in a way that would process in a clockwise direction, 1, then 2, then 3, and then I fill in what they are. This is a 1, 2, 3, 4 carbon long chain, so that's why I just wrote C4H9. Second priority thing is this ethyl group, so C2H5. Third priority I fill in CH3, because that's my methyl group. And that is a very good way to write a Fisher projection for the structure. If you wanted a wedge and hash line projection, you can very easily switch it to wedges and hash lines and convert it like we did in Part B. There is a little bit more of vocabulary associated with stereochemistry as well. Uh, we, we know that two molecules that are non-superimposable mirror images of each other are enantiomers, and things get a little bit more complicated when you have multiple stereocenters on the same molecule. In those kinds of cases, you can have diastereomers and mesocompounds. So I want to talk about those here. Um, so for an example, I show four different isomers for 3-chloro-2-butanol. All right, so that has chiral centers at C2 and C3. Now 1 and 2, you can even see on the page, if I imagine a mirror here, these groups are reflected in that mirror. These are mirror images of each other, but they're not the same because the chlorine is either on the right or the left, depending on which one we're looking at. So those are examples of enantiomers. Likewise, 3 and 4, if you imagine a mirror here, these substituents reflect, the tops are the same, everything matches up, so those are definitely enantiomers of each other. Those are easy to pick out. Now any other pairs, like 2 and 3, or 1 and 4, or 2 and 4, these are not going to be mirror images of each other, but they're also not identical. So they're not superimposable, means they're not the same as each other, they're not mirror images, and this is what we call diastereomers. This is how you identify them. Now mesocompounds are a little bit tricky. You see that I have these four compounds here. Compound 1 and 2 appear to be mirror images of each other, and they are, but each of these molecules, 1 and 2, also have internal symmetry. So they're actually not chiral. Remember, a symmetric compound can't be chiral. It doesn't have handedness. 
So a meso compound is a special term given to compounds that do have stereogenic atoms, but because of the internal symmetry, the whole molecule itself is not chiral. That's what a meso compound is. Now compounds three and four, they're not the same as one and two, and they don't have symmetry top and bottom. You see there's a Cl here. It doesn't reflect to the H. In the meso compounds, you have to have symmetric distribution. So three and four are not the same as one and two. One and two are identical. They're meso compounds. They're identical to each other, just drawn different ways. So three and four are in answer to each other because these two reflect to each other. But compound one with compound three or compound one compared to compound four. Those are examples of diastereomers just like what we saw on the other page. And stereochemistry is studied usually pretty early on in organic one because it has a great influence on the products that we can see in different reactions. And that's nicely illustrated by the SN1, SN2, E1, and E2 reactions. One of the most complicated tasks that we face in organic one is being able to differentiate which of these reactions happens because the substrate, the starting material, in all four of these reactions is really just an alkyl group with a leaving group on it. All four of these could happen. And the one that predominates in a given set of circumstances first has to do with whether you have a good nucleophile, whether you have a, a strong base. An SN2 reaction requires a good nucleophile. So if I have a substrate that's capable of doing an SN2 reaction, and I have a good nucleophile, but it's a weak base, a strong base is good for an E2 reaction. So if I have a good nucleophile, that's good for SN2, but it's a weak base, so it can't really do E2. Now here's some examples of those. That's a great condition for doing an SN2 reaction. SN2 should be favored in most of those cases. If we think about the case where we have a good nucleophile and a strong base, it gets a little bit more complicated. Your good nucleophile allows you to do an SN2. A strong base allows you to do an E2. You know, depending on the substrate, you got to have a good leaving group and all that. And if it's tertiary, that's the slowest for SN2, so only E2 could happen. But that, that's more of a complicated scenario. Now, if you have a poor nucleophile, you can't really do an SN2 reaction very well. But if that species also happens to be a strong base, that's great for an E2 reaction. And an E2 reaction works on primary, secondary, and tertiary. Um, a great example would be a potassium t-butoxide. You might have LDA, lithium diisopropyl amide. Those are great reagents to do an E2 reaction. So that's how your reagents indicate what type of reaction you should have that might be favored. Your substrate can also help you determine which type of reaction you have, E2 versus SN2 we're only talking about right now. Um, the substrate is the thing with the leaving group on it. So if I have a primary substrate, this carbon is primary, it has a leaving group on it. If I don't have a bulky base, got a good nucleophile, SN2 is going to be favored. SN2 is fastest on the methyl or primary substrate. If it's secondary, on the other hand, and you have some scenario where there's a good nucleophile and a strong base, and it's secondary, a lot of times you'll get some mixture. But the bulkier your substrate is, the bulkier the attacking group, which, whether it be thought of as a base or a nucleophile, the more E2 you'll have. If there's beta branching, E2 will be by far the major product. If it's tertiary, that's too bulky to do an SN2, even if there's a good nucleophile, you'll only be able to do the E2 reaction. So, so far in this page, we've only talked about um, SN2 versus E2. So when would SN1 and E1 be favored? Well, they're favored when there's neither a good nucleophile or a strong base. And of course, these do not work for primary substrates that don't have resonance, because you have to be able to form the carbocation intermediate in the SN1 and E1 reactions. Remember, this is just a review of organic one. We're not trying to teach you all these reactions right now, but if you don't remember these kinds of concepts, that might be something to go back and review. This flowchart can be useful for figuring out which of the reactions will predominate for an alkyl halide under a given condition. The first question I would ask is, well, is there a good nucleophile or a strong base? Because if I don't have a good nucleophile, I can't do SN2. If I don't have a strong base, I can't do E2. So that really helps me screen out which reactions are even possible to start. We can go through and ask all these questions. If I say yes, I do have a good nucleophile or a strong base, I then will sort it into one of three groups. It could be something that's a strong base and a poor nucleophile. Right, maybe potassium t-butoxide, which produces t-butoxide anions in solution. Then I'll only get E2. 
if I have something that is a strong base and a good nucleophile, it's a reagent that's capable of doing SN2 or E2. Maybe sodium hydroxide produces hydroxide in solution. That's a good nucleophile and a strong base. Then it's more complicated. But if I then look at my alkyl halide in its primary, I say, well, that's the fastest substrate for SN2. It's the slowest substrate for E2. So SN2 is going to win out there. If, on the other hand, it's tertiary. Tertiary doesn't work for SN2. It's too bulky to let that nucleophile into the carbon. So only E2 is going to happen. The most complicated case then would be if it's secondary, because that could potentially work for SN2 or E2. If there's a beta branch, that means a branch adjacent to that secondary site. Here's your leaving group. It's on a secondary carbon. That's secondary. If adjacent to that, there's another branch in addition to the parent chain. That's your beta branch right there. That's going to slow down your SN2 reaction. That'll make the E2 reaction predominate. If it's not a beta branch, you have the capacity to potentially get a mixture of SN2 and E2. All right, third category under this umbrella. Good nucleophile is a weak base. Well, that's very easy. If it's a good nucleophile, it can do SN2, but a weak base can't do E2. So any substrate that works for SN2 will do SN2, primary or secondary, SN2. If it's tertiary, too bulky for SN2. You've got three branches there on the carbon with your leaving group. Your nucleophile can't get in between all those branches. There's too much steric blockage there. So you're not going to be able to do an SN2. So we've ruled out SN2. We've ruled out E2 because it's not a strong base. Only options left are SN1 and E1. So that's why that happens in that case. Now let's go all the way back up to the top. So the first question we asked was, is there a good nucleophile or a strong base? Well, say we're just mixing all our alkyl halide in water or in alcohol. Well, water and alcohols, those are not good nucleophiles or strong bases. So we say, no, there is not a good nucleophile or strong base. So we can't do SN2. We can't do E2. The only reactions of this class that we have available to us are the SN1 and E1. And those will work as long as you can make a relatively stable carbocation. Primary cations without any resonance to help stabilize them are too unstable to form. Those will generally give you no reaction under standard conditions. All the other alkyl halides, Rx, will give you a mixture of SN1 and E1. Now there are some ways you can control concentrations and heat to get one to predominate over the other. We're not going to worry about that for our course. All right, so this flow chart is a great general guideline for the most common cases for alkyl halides and should serve you really well in addressing problems in organic one and two. So if you want to take a look at the flow chart, maybe flip back and forth between the flow chart and these practice problems, let's test it out and see how well this flow chart works and determine whether each of these reactions will proceed predominantly by SN1, SN2, E1, or E2 reactions, or some combination thereof. And then you should be able to draw the products for all these things based on the knowledge you learned in Organic 1. So in the first case, you look at this reagent. This reagent will produce methoxide anions in solution because it is an ionic compound. The sodium will break off as an Na plus cation. That species is both a good nucleophile and a strong base. If you don't know how to do that, you should consult your instructor, get some guidance on how to identify whether something is a strong base or good nucleophile. That's the first step. It's very, very important. You won't even be able to use the flow chart if you can't figure that part out. But once you know that, it's a good nucleophile. It's a strong base. You check this out. It's a secondary alkyl halide. You identify the parent chain. On the flow chart, you'll notice there's this part where it asks you if there's a beta branch. We see yes, good nucleophile, strong base. This one's both. Oh no, it's secondary. That's the most complicated thing. If there's a beta branch, that gets us to an E2 reaction. So the flow chart is great. It tells you there's an E2 reaction. You've got to also know what kind of product you get from the E2 reaction, be able to figure out which of the potential alkenes you make from that. And that's the one shown here. All right, let's take a look at the second one. Same substrate as the first one. But this is a covalent compound. It will not break into anions. It's just a neutral compound. It's not going to be a strong base. It's not going to be a good nucleophile. So poor nucleophile, weak base. So we can't do SN2, can't do E2. Our only choices are SN1 and E1. You ask yourself, does that work on a secondary site? Yes. So we get a mixture of SN1 and E1. In that case, there is a carbocation rearrangement involved. You'll have to be able to figure that part out. All right, next case, we have the same reagent as we had above. It's a poor nucleophile, it's a weak base, but now it's primary. The site with the leaving group is primary. 
that would not be a very stable cation if I tried to do a heterolysis here and make a primary carbocation no resonance. So when I can't do the SN2, I can't do the E2, and now it's primary so I can't do SN1 or E1. I just get no reaction if I heat this up in methanol. Next we have a primary site again, but now we have a strong base and a good nucleophile. So you say, well, the strong base allows us to do an E2. The good nucleophile would allow us to do an SN2. This is primary. That's the fastest for SN2 and the slowest for E2. So we're going to get an SN2 product, which looks like this. Finally, you've got a tertiary site with a species that will produce a good nucleophile and a strong base in solution. Tertiary is slowest for SN2. doesn't work for SN2 at all, really. So it's the E2 product. And we have a second page of these types of problems. And it's a good idea to pause this and look through this and try to figure it out before you just watch the answers. And the answers are provided here. Now this first one's drawn in kind of a less intuitive form, but you should know that the sodium would dissociate from the oxygen to make the corresponding ions. And if you draw the Lewis dot structure, or just the Lewis structure in the line bond form for this compound, you see that it's an acetate and that has resonance stabilization, so it's not a strong base. It's stabilized by resonance. So you should get the SN2 reaction on a secondary substrate that has Walden inversion. So if you see I've put the nucleophile on with a hash line where there used to be a wedge. If I have a covalent species, no metal ion to dissociate as a cation readily, that's a poor nucleophile and a weak base. It's secondary, that works for a SN1 or E1 reaction. In the case of SN1, it is stereo random, so you should have a racemic mixture. That's important to be able to demonstrate. And of course, follow your Zaitsev rule to figure out which alkene, that one or that one, you would make with the E1. So these are all things to think about when you're evaluating how well you remember the things from organic one. If we have a salt like this, it will dissociate to sodium plus and I minus. And I minus is a really good nucleophile, but it's a very weak base. On a secondary substrate, you would tend to anticipate an SN2 reaction happening. Again, we're doing this reaction on a chiral center, so we would have to indicate inversion in the product. And now we have a secondary substrate without any beta branching with a strong base and a good nucleophile. So you should get an SN2 reaction, not a racemic mixture, it's inverted as drawn. And the E2 product would be the Zaitsev alkene. Finally, if you have the secondary substrate with this very poor nucleophile, very weak base, sort of the same scenario as we saw up here um, near box B, you get a racemic mixture where the OCH3 portion of this nucleophilic, poor nucleophilic site um, would attach, and you have this alkene. If you have alcohols, remember the alcohols are also capable of doing SN1, SN2, E1, E2 reactions. You can also do oxidations of alcohols. The tricky thing about the alcohols is you have to turn that OH into some type of good leaving group before you can get it to do a reaction uh, by SN1, SN2, E1, or E2. So for that reason, we treat the reactions of alcohols, ethers, and epoxides in a sort of separate lesson than we did for substitution and elimination. One way to activate the OH group is with a strong acid, like hydrobromic. A couple other ways are to use thionyl chloride or phosphorus tribromide. So you'll want to review these products and, and make sure that you can indicate the correct pathway and the correct products that you form, SN2 reactions in these first three cases. Look back and review these oxidizing agents as ways to make carboxylic acids or aldehydes. You may have learned PCC, PDC, or Swern oxidation reactions. Um, those will all accomplish the same type of species as the product. There are also these sulfonate chlorides, right? You can have that listed with or without pyridine or other mild base. But whether or not that pyridine's there, you see that species. It could be a mesyl chloride, a tosyl chloride, a chlorotriflate, but these will all form the same type of product. The only thing that changes is what this R group is. This is a way to make the OH into a good leaving group and then stop right there. And you'll notice when you just react at the O, not at the carbon, all you're doing is changing that O into a good leaving group. You swap the H out for that unit. 
but you don't invert the stereochemistry of the carbon if you don't do a reaction of the carbon. All right, you can do these other types of reactions. You can do SN1, E1. Um, E1 reactions for alcohols generally are mediated by sulfuric acid, as in this case. That should look familiar to you if you've taken organic one recently. And then the reactions of ethers. The only reaction of ethers for which you're responsible in organic two is generally the reaction with the hydrohalic acid, hydroiodic or hydrobromic. And hydroiodic really in practical context works the best. But one side of your ether will be substituted with the halogen. The other side will be protonated by the proton given by the acid to make the alcohol. And being able to evaluate which half is which is the important part for these ether uh, cleavage reactions. So in this case you see that the more substituted side got substituted with the bromine and the less substituted side got to keep the O and would be the alcohol. Now there are a couple two-step reactions. If I take a sulfonate chloride and that step makes this into a good leaving group and then I react it with a nucleophile well I can get net substitution by SN2 over two steps in that case. If I have epoxides you will need to evaluate whether your nucleophile is attacking while there's an acid present such as hydrobromic acid in those cases, the nucleophile will attack at the more substituted side by an SN2 type mechanism. If I don't have an acid present, as in the first step here, there's no acid, you just have sodium methoxide and that's it, then the nucleophilic side of that ionic compound will attack the less substituted carbon. That means that the stereochemistry over here, that this carbon that wasn't attacked, will stay the same. And here's another example of an E1 reaction on an alcohol using sulfuric acid. And it may look unusual to have the double bond way over here when the OH that was taken off is here, but you'll have to look for a carbocation rearrangement. The other really major set of reactions that is typically taught in an organic chemistry one class are all of these addition reactions to alkenes. So I have about three pages in this video of alkene reactions. So you should pause this, see if you recognize these different uh, reagents. If not, you want to review these and see if you can predict which type of products you should get as the major products of all these reactions. You've also got to consider what is the stereochemistry of these types of products. You want to know when racemic mixtures are formed, when meso compounds are formed, and when one specific stereoisomer of it might be formed. In order to address such questions, you need to know whether the two things that adds the alkene add sin or anti. The second page continues with some of the alkene reactions for which you are responsible in Organic 2. And these are the most common types of reagents that are used on standardized exams, whether you're taking an MCAT or a DAT. All these types of entrance exams, they tend to feature these types of alkene reactions. So if you pause the video and try to figure these out, the answers are provided in the next slide as well. And finally, the last page of these alkene reactions. You should pause it here, see if you can figure these out, and pay attention to the second step in these ozonolysis reactions. They can lead to different outcomes. All right, so here are the answers to the alkene addition reaction of the other page. We have some epoxidations. We have some hydrobromination oxidation. The oxidation mediated by osmium tetroxide and two different variations of the ozonolysis reaction.